بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters welcome to our series on the stories of the quran subhanallah it's been uh, seven days already i think uh, since the beginning of ramadan but i've not been well uh, and i've been recovering from some illness but alhamdulillah uh, i am much better now alhamdulillah and now we are ready to get started so my sincere apologies to my brothers and my sisters who are expecting this to start in the beginning of Ramadan um, and uh, my apologies for not being able to do so uh, but inshallah what we have left of Ramadan bi'idhnillah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life then inshallah uh, the tafsir of some of the surahs that we have coming up inshallah ta'ala will be uh, I hope uh, very beneficial uh, very enlightening and bi'idhnillah will open up your minds inshallah uh, I'd like to start off the stories of the Qur'an by talking about those surahs in the Qur'an that have uh, a lot of benefit for the believers. Stories. Um, everything uh, that we know today that people are attracted to are usually a story. Um, Hollywood is a story. Bollywood are stories, you know. The movies are all stories. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same uslub, the same methodology of stories in the Qur'an in order to help us believers, human beings, to draw relevance to uh, the lives of the people that he's talking about. And from those important stories are stories of righteous people and stories of the wrongdoers as well. And the stories of the righteous people, they might be prophets of God, they might be righteous people that are mentioned in the Quran that are not prophets of God, might be stories of uh, the Sahaba, uh, of an incident that happened such as Battle of Badr or Battle of Uhud, or it could be stories of one of the prophets of God and some of the, some of the, some of the trials that they went through. Wallahi, within the stories of the Qur'an is enough for believers to ponder and to think about. So inshallah ta'ala in this tafsir series, we're going to be taking the tafsir of some of the most important surahs of the Qur'an that contain a lot of stories. So definitely we'll be taking surah, uh, surah Maryam for example. It is one of the surahs of the Qur'an that has the story of Maryam, story of Zakaria, story of, of uh, Isa alayhi the salam, story of uh, Yahya, the story of um, of, uh, of Ibrahim, story of Ismail, والسلام, so many beautiful stories. Uh, we will also be taking, for example, Surah uh, at taha which is the most comprehensive story of Musa, والسلام, very beautiful from A to Z. The story of Musa uh, is, in, uh, is in Surah Taha. Uh, we're going to take Surah, Ka, uh, Surah Kahf, which is the story of the, of the young people in the cave, the story of the two people who had the gardens, the story of uh, mashallah, uh, of many of the prophets of God, including the story of uh, Dhul Qarnayn, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, so many lessons for us, walhamdulillah. Uh, the story of Khidr, the story of Musa with Khidr, uh, etc. Also, we're going to take, inshallah ta'ala, the story that we're going to start with today, or the surah we're going to start off today, which is Surah Saad. Surah Saad is a surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of nine prophets of God. So I thought that inshallah, since it mentions nine prophets of God, this is one of the surahs that you know, believers should really learn. And if they learn it, then you know, you're learning about the nine prophets of God and some of the trials that they went through. It'll become a good way for me to introduce to you uh, these prophets of God, where they came from, uh, how, they, how their lives finished, what they did in their life. And alhamdulillah, draw lessons from the stories that Allah Azza tells us. Surah Saad was revealed in the 10th or the 11th year of Hijrah towards the end of the life of Abu Talib, the uncle of Rasulullah as he was passing away, the Quraysh became very anxious because they became anxious because as you know, they were haughty and proud people. And so they didn't want to, uh, it to be known that whilst the uncle of Rasulullah was alive, the, uh, the Muslims were, uh, you know, were protected by the uncle and so the, the Quraysh chiefs could not do anything. And only after the uncle passed away, that's when the Quraysh chief chiefs could, took advantage of the Muslims. So what they wanted to do was whilst Abu Talib was still alive to put pressure on Rasulullah to recant his view. And they got together in a group and they came to the Prophet they came to Abu Talib and said bring your companion Muhammad the Prophet came and then uh, this group of Quraysh, 25 of them they told Abu Talib saying Abu Talib tell your uh, nephew to recant his view. If he does so then we will leave him alone. We will not trouble him, we will not pressure him, we will not pressure the people that follow him. 
who will simply carry on our way and he will carry on his way. So Abu Talib looked at Rasulullah and said, oh, uh, oh my nephew, and this is so beautiful, look at how Abu Talib was with his nephew in that he didn't pressure him, he was a real friend to him. So he said to Muhammad sallallahu he said, uh, oh my nephew, what do you see? So the nephew, Muhammad sallallahu he said, uh, oh uncle, tell them that, that I will promise them all of Arabia and all of the world will submit to them, to Quraysh, if they only say one word. And so the chiefs were very uh, surprised, like, wow, what? All of Arabia will submit to us? All of the world will become our under our command? What is that one word that you want us to say? So he said, La ilaha illallah. Say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And so that's when Abu Talib, that's when Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, uh, the, the, the chiefs of Quraysh became very haughty and proud. They all got together and they decided to start leaving. And Allah talks about this in Surah Sa'd very early on. Surah Sa'd includes the story of uh, the trials of Dawud So one of the mistakes of Dawud Allah will talk about in Surah Sa'd and how Dawud repented. Allah will talk about Sulaiman Allah will talk about Shu'aib and his difficulties. Allah will talk about many of the prophets of God. And then finally Allah will end the Surah Sa'd by talking about the story of Adam and, and Iblis and how Iblis disobeyed Allah and the main reason of doing so was because he was jealous. He was jealous that Adam was chosen, Ali Sallallahu was chosen as the Khalifa of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala on this earth, whereas the people were not, whereas his people, he himself was not chosen. And so Allah Zawajal uses that story to remind the same Quraysh that gathered together in front of Abu Talib that if it's your jealousy that is causing you to leave Islam and not follow it because you're jealous that Allah has chosen Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not you as a prophet of God, then know this, that your end will be the same end as Iblis's end. His jealousy led him to Jahannam, your jealousy will lead you to Jahannam as well. And with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes off Surah Sa'd. So let's take Surah Sa'd, inshallah. It's a very beautiful surah, so much meaning in it, so much wisdom in it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and me to be able to understand the surah, to memorize it, and alhamdulillah to recite it in our salawat. So let's take it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, Sa'd. And this is one of the most miracles, the, the miraculous words of Allah Azza wa Jal. Fifteen meanings, uh, fifteen different types of opinions the scholars have about the words such as Sa'd, Kafa, Ya'in, Sa'd, Alif, Lam, Mim, etc. Uh, however, the stronger opinion, inshallah, of all of the opinions is that it refers back to the Quran itself because the very next verse, usually after Kaf or uh, Alif Lam Mim or Saad is, is in reference back to the same Quran from which these Ahruf are from. So Saad wal Qurani the Dhikr. Saad, Allah says, and then he refers back to the same words which are from the Quran. So he says, Wal Quran, and I swear by the Quran, the Dhikr, the possessor of Dhikr, of, rem of remembrance, of the, or the reminder, uh, which is the Quran, which is a reminder for people. Kafaru. Rather, it is those who disbelieve. Fi izzatin wa shiqaq. Fi izza, meaning they are haughty and proud, wa shiqaq, and they are distraught and they are divided. And this is the dichotomy that the disbelievers live in. Those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are far away from re uh, remembrance, those who, when the truth comes to them, then they reject it. They are the true disbelievers. These disbelievers, fi izzatin wa shiqaq, they are first haughty and proud. Meaning, huh? Am I going to listen to this Quran? No, not me. I'm better than this. So this is the first haughtiness. And then the shiqaq that comes after it is that because you've rejected this hidayah, Allah, Allah changes your heart, Allah gives you misguidance, Allah takes you away from hidayah. So as a result, you are in shiqaq. You are completely befooled. And you are completely uh, bamboozled about what to do in your life. A decision comes to you, you don't know what to do. The simplest of things, should I buy this, should I buy that? You are completely lost at what decision to make. You are in total shiqaq, total, dis total misguidance. Not only in your greater life, which is your relationship with Allah but also in your day-to-day -day living. You can't make a simple decision because your heart is so divided and it is, you, you are so confused. 
كم أهلكنا من قبلهم كم how many أهلكنا have we destroyed من قبلهم from before them in reference to the Quraysh so before that meaning before Quraysh how many have we destroyed destroyed من قرنين from generations فنادوا so they called upon each other when did they call upon each other at the time of the punishment of Allah so for example they would see the punishment of Allah coming and say ya Ahmed ya Muhammad ya Yusuf where are you come فنادوا وَلَا تَحِينَ manas, Meaning that there was no time for escape. Meaning that when the punishment came, the time for adab of Allah Azzawajal came, there was no more time left for anyone to escape the punishment of Allah Azzawajal. وَلَا تَحِينَ manas, Meaning when Allah's punishment comes at the appointed time that encompasses everybody in that area and then there is absolutely no more time to escape. So this is the promise of Allah, that repent to Allah, come back to Him before that time comes. Because when the time comes, it is complete. Allah's punishment is complete. Walat hina manas. Walata meaning it has removed. Hain, the time of manas, the time of escape and of safety. Wa'ajibu anja'ahum munziru minhum. Wa'ajibu, and they are surprised. Anja'ahum, that there has come to them. Munziru minhum, a warner from amongst themselves. Wa'qala al-kafiruna. And the disbelievers say in this amazement, هذا ساحر كذاب. He's nothing but a sahir, a magician, a liar. You know, they said this about the Prophet ﷺ. They called him a magician, they called him a liar, they called him a soothsayer, they called him a majnoon, they called him so many things. All of them lies, all of them misplaced, all of them in, uh, in utter arrogance. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has quoted them in this Qur'an. I will remind them of it on the day of judgment and this will, these words of theirs will become a hasra, a means of them entering Jahannam on the day of judgment. Aja'ala al-alihata ilaha wahida. And that was a statement of Abu Jahl. Allah quotes Abu Jahl saying this statement. Aja'ala al-alihata ilaha wahida. And this is when Muhammad Wasallam, when he was gathered with Abu Talib and with all the chiefs of Quraysh, and he said, say one kalima by which all of Arabia will submit to you. So what was that kalima? Oh, Muhammad says, tell us. So he said, la ilaha illallah. So that's when Abu Jahl said, no, 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 this is misguidance. This is stupidity. Muhammad sallallahu stop it. You know, stop, don't say any more. And then he looked at everyone else. And then he said, aja'ala al-alihata ilaha wahida. And he, how audacious is his statement, guys, that he has made all the gods into one god. Aja'ala al-alihata ilaha wahida. Inna hadha la shay'un ajab. This is... A matter which is very, very strange. Ujab, this is very strange opinion. Can you see how these people were? These people wanted to believe in gods, but they also, their thinking of their gods was so bad and so wrong that they used to think these gods are deficient. Meaning, how can they make all of these gods into one god? Each god is only appropriate for one, one thing. That's the god of war, that's the god of love, that's the god of divorce, that's a god of anger and hatred, that's a god of seas and that's a god of business and trade. That one can't, can't do the job of the other one, that one can't do the job of the other one. Can, can't they even see how within their own selves they have restricted the power of their own gods? So how do they worship a god that is able to do only one thing and is complete buffoon and complete fool at another? And that's why when people worship so many gods, like for example, one of the scholars of, the, of Hinduism, he mentioned that the Hindus believe in 330 million gods. And when they believe in so many gods, can, can they not see that if this god is only able to do one thing and he is not able to do the other, how is he able to be a true god? Because look at us. As human beings, mashallah, some of us are able to do quite a lot. They are jack of all trades, some of us, right? Some sports people, for example. You put them in cricket, they are fantastic crickets men. You put them in basketball, they are brilliant at basketball. You put them in swimming, they are the fastest swimmer. Sometimes they are very good at many things, but these gods that they are setting up, that they say is only good for one issue, don't they see how they have made their gods so weak by actually saying they are only good for one thing and not for the other? And so my brothers and sisters in Islam, within shirk itself is evidence of its own futility. And that's what our scholars used to tell us. That within batil is evidence of its own butlan. Yeah? Within something which is wrong and incorrect is evidence of the whole thing of itself, in and of itself being wrong. One talaqa al minhum. So a group, a mala, in talaqa, in talaqa is to move. For one talaqa al mala, 
So a group amongst them moved off, min home from amongst the group of that had gathered with Abu Talib. Animshu wasbiru, as they were moving off in groups, one of them was telling the other one, Animshu, let's go, let's go, there's nothing here. Muhammad is saying the same thing, you know, let's go, let's get out of here. Animshu wasbiru ala alihatikum, be patient with your gods, meaning be patient upon the worship of your gods. And this is the problem today, brothers and sisters. You take bad friends and they lead you to Jahannam. You take bad friends and if your teenagers have bad friends and if you're a teenager, you have bad friends, they will lead you to Jahannam. I mean, imagine, right? Imagine a mirror that you look into and you know, it's, it reminds me of the mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of, of, of them all? You know, the, uh, uh, the Snow White uh, stories and the, 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 the mirror of the, uh, of the witch. You know, if your mirror doesn't speak to you and tell you the truth, and if your mirror presents to you an image which is false, so the witch was saying, who is the fairest of them all? And the mirror was trying to lie and say, no, 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 you're the fairest, you're the fairest. So if your friend is going to lie to you, if your mirror is not going to present to you your image as you are, and they're going to be liars, then, then unfortunately you will, you will be misguided. In the same way, you take your friends who are meant to reflect to you your true state and being, and instead they lead you into Jahannam, they lead you into the wrong path, you're going to end up into the, in the wrong place with them. So be very careful of what sort of friends you take. And that is why the Prophet said in the authentic hadith, he said, a believer should not befriend except a believer. A believer should not befriend except a believer. وَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ أَنِمْشُ وَاصْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ آلِهَتِكُمْ إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ يُرَادٌ Verily, this is something which is intended. Meaning, God has always intended for you to worship other gods. This is what they're trying to say. Look how, how illogical the statements are. But this is what they said. مَا سَمِعْنَا بِهَذَا We have never heard about this. You heard about what? About the fact that all the gods should be one god or that there should be only one god. مَا سَمِعْنَا بِهَذَا فِي الْمِلَّةِ الْآخِرَةِ In the religion of the past, meaning the religion of our forefathers. إِنْ هَذَا اِخْتِلَاقِ إِلَّا اِخْتِلَاقِ This is nothing but an absolute forgery and fabrication. They're calling Islam a forgery and fabrication, whereas Islam was the asl and shirk is the forgery and fabrication. أَأُنزِلْ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا And now they actually also show not only their disgust for the message, they saw their disgust for the messenger. So they say, أُنزِل عليه أُنزِل is has it been revealed عليه upon him مِمْ عليه الذكر the remembrance مِمْ بَيْنِنَا rather than us and he, what makes Muhammad system so special in he, the the revelation was come upon him Allah chose him why him he's an orphan he doesn't have any wealth he's got nothing look at us we have wealth we have children we have status we have honor we are chiefs. Why would Allah choose him? Because you see, the prob main problem with these people is that they saw their wealth, their children, their status as a sign of Allah loving them. They equated the love of Allah, success in this dunya as success in the akhirah. And this is the major misguidance, ikhwani. Just because Allah has given you wealth in this dunya, status, pride, wealth, children, whatever, does not at all mean Allah loves you. Does not mean it. It could mean Allah hates you. But He still gives you all of this in order to make you fooled and to use this to actually close your hearts to that which is greater and bigger. So be very careful. Unzil alayhi dhikru min baynina. Has the revelation been revealed to him rather than to us? Bal, rather, hum fi shakkin min dhikri. They are in doubt about my remembrance. They constantly doubt my remembrance. The reason why is because they have yet to taste Lamma, they have yet to Yaduku taste my adab, my punishment. That's what's happened. Yeah, they are in they are rejecting, they are doubting my remembrance because they have yet to taste my punishment. And this is why sometimes that's what you need. You just need difficulty, you need trials, you need tribulations. Then and only then do you realize the gravity of the sin of what we are doing, Ikhwani. Sometimes we need that. We need that difficulty in our lives. If we don't have that difficulty, we sometimes don't realize where we are and how far we are from the truth. Do they have, Allah now asks a question back to these people, to the disbelievers, 
Am'indahum, do they have khaza'in, the treasures, or the vaults. Khaza'in, khazina is like a vault, so khaza'in is like the vaults. Rahmati rabbik, the, the vaults of the treasures of the mercy of Allah, Al-Aziz, the most honored, Al-Wahhab, the one who, who bestows. Do they have that? And what is Allah referring to here? The tafsir of this verse, according to the pious predecessors, refers to nubuwa, to prophethood. Meaning, do they hold the keys of who Allah should choose as prophets of God? Is that what they think? And this is what Allah says is Al-Aziz Al-Wahhab. And that is why, Ikhwani, one of the most greatest names of Allah that is associated with nubuwa is number one, Aziz. Why? Because nubuwa is Izzah. Yeah? Because Verily, Izzah, honor only belongs to Allah and to, the, and to the prophets and to the believers who follow them, but the munafiqeen will never understand. So we know that one of the most important things, qualities of being a prophet is that Allah has honored you. So therefore, if you are not only a prophet of God, but today you are a follower of the prophet of God, that's also in one way honor. And if you're not a prophet of God, neither are you a follower of the prophet, you are, you are a follower of the prophet, but you are the best of the followers of the prophets, like the scholars of Islam, like the du'at who are calling people to the path of the messengers of God, then you are not only a special human being, you are the best of the best. You are from the best of the best. You are honored. Because if Izzah belongs to Allah and to the, to the prophets, it must also belong to the ones who follow the prophets. And the best of the followers are the scholars and the du'at, and as a result, they have izzah. And that's why the first uh, name that Allah mentions whilst talking about the khaza'inu rahmati rabbi, which is the treasures of the mercy of Allah, which is the, the nubuwa, the first attribute Allah talks about is al-izzah, al-aziz. The second one is called al-wahhab, because this is one of the most biggest names of Allah uh, about bestowing. The wahhab is someone Al-Wahhab is the one who bestows. And he bestows because he has so much to give. Uh, imagine if I were to give you an image of a king who has massive treasure behind him, massive treasure, a big chariot with full of gold, and he's grabbing wealth like this, and he's just scooping it to the people, and the people are scrambling on the roads to grab that wealth. That is the one who is like the Wahhab, the one who gives. But Allah's Wahhab, and he is giving, is the giving of a king. And that is why Al-Wahhab is a name which is not permissible for any human being. It's only permissible for Allah Azzawajal. Because the giving of Allah not only includes gold and silver, but includes things which no one else can give, such as life, such as children, such as health, such as, such as status and power, such as uh, Jannah in the Akhirah, such as safety from Jahannam. So this is Al-Wahhab. And that's why when you make dua to Allah Azzawajal, and you're asking Allah uh, for safety from uh, poverty, or you're asking Allah for an escape from the, the, the poverty that you're in, or you're asking Allah to pay your debt, ask Allah by the name Al-Wahhab. Yeah? So you say, Ya Aziz, Ya Wahhab, Ya, ya Ghani. O oh, oh Allah, the one who is rich, the one who is the most honored, the one who is the Wahhab, the bestower. O oh, Allah, give me this. Yeah? So Al-Wahhab is one of those names of Allah Azawajal that is very critical for a believer to remember, especially when he's asking Allah for more provisions. Am lahum mulku samawati wal ard, or do they have the kingship or the dominion of the heavens and the earth? Wama baynahuma and between them. Fal yartaqu fil asbab. So let them go into the heights and let them see if they can ascend the heights. Fal yartaqu fil asbab. Jundun. Now Allah Azawajal in verse number 11 here gives a miracle, yeah? And that's why, you know, when you read this verse, if you open up, I don't know, a translation of uh, uh, Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali, rahimahullah, or some other tafsir, you don't understand the true meaning of what Allah is about to say in the next verse. Even in that verse, am عِنْدَهُمْ خَزَائِنِ وَرَحْمَةِ رَبِّكَ الْعَزِيزِ الْوَحَبِ Do you know the meaning of it? You would read it as, do they have the keys to the uh, treasures of Allah? That's not what Allah is referring to in the real tafsir. The real tafsir is, do they... Uh, can, do they uh, have the right to choose who the prophets of God should be or do I have the right to choose who the prophets of God should be, right? So people are of different types and, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the translation is of different types and 
uh, when you just refer to tafsir, to translation, you really cannot understand the Quran. So my sincere request to my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, take the time to ponder on the Quran and to understand what the Quran is really trying to say. Jundum ma hunalika mahzumu min al ahzab. Jundun, a group amongst them, a jund, meaning jund, jund is the, uh, the army. So jundum ma hunalik, so a group of the army amongst them, mahzumun, will be destroyed. Okay, hazim is to be uh, destroyed. Mahzum will be the one that is destroyed by another party. So another party will destroy them. Min al ahzab, from the group that will fight. So what is Allah talking about here? Allah is saying that from that group that stood in front of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and had the audacity to say, let's go back to our families and we don't want to listen to what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a group amongst them will be destroyed in the battle of Badr. So in this verse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is giving the prediction of the battle of Badr and saying, Jundun, a group of the army amongst them will be destroyed, min al ahzab. They will be destroyed from the army. And they are the 25 of the Sanadid of Quraysh that will be killed at the Battle of Badr. So Allah is predicting that here in verse number 11 in Surah Sad. كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ وَعَادٍ وَفِرْعَوْنَ ذُو الْأَوْتَادِ Now Allah Zawajal moves to how these people were also similar to those people who Disbelief before, they met their end. So Quraysh, you will meet yours. Kathabat qablahum. Before them, the following people, kathaba, disbelieved. And kathib is synonymous with disbelief in the Quran, right? And that's why Allah used the word kathib, and that's why Muslim should never ever lie. Muslim always speaks the truth. Kathabat qablahum, their, their disbelief before them. Qawmu Nuh, the people of Nuh, Wa'ad, the people of Ad, and Fir'aun, and Fir'aun and his people, Dhul Autad. Fir'aun, the possessor of stakes. I'm going to come to that in just a bit. So, Qawmu Nuh, I think we all know who they were. Ten generations after Adam alayhi uh, salam, people started to follow, uh, to worship other gods other than Allah. So, Allah said, Nuh alayhi salam, for 950 years, he called them, and those were, those were the, they were the people of Nuh. Wa'ad, who were the people of Ad? Ad were a people that lived in Yemen near the sand dunes of Yemen, the Ahqab, the, the Ahqab uh, of Yemen, the Ahqaf of, of, of Yemen. Uh, and they were, some said they were actually originally from the northern parts of Arabia. Some said they were African of origin. Some said they were Yemeni origin. Whatever they were, they were essentially living in that parts, those parts of, of Yemen. And of course, who the Alaihi was sent to them and who tried to correct them, but they were too arrogant. Wa'ad and Fir'aun obviously lived in Egypt, uh, the, the king who claimed to be a god, uh, and he was the possessor of stakes. Stakes meaning autad, autad is stakes. What does it mean? The scholars have three different meanings about the word autad. Some said it means the pyramids, because the pyramids were like stakes in the ground, right? So they're like stakes put into the ground, and then of course they've got an uh, elaborate system underneath the ground, so it's almost like they're holding on to the earth, and so the pyramids were, were called stakes. The second was that when Fir'aun used to kill people, then he used to kill them on stakes, so that when he used to kill a Banu Israel, a poor Banu Israel, then what he would do, he, was, he would impal them, he would take the stakes, long pieces of wood, and he would drive them from the bottom all the way to the top of the mouth until the stakes would come out, and then he would put them up, and the human being, the poor human being who had already passed away, his body would be left there as a sign for all people to see that if you disbelieve in Fir'aun or you don't listen to him, that end which happened to him will happen to you as well. So this is the Lord of the stakes, Fir'aun. The third reason why they were called stakes, Wallahu ta'ala alam, was that when Fir'aun's enemy, uh, army used to encamp, they used to have large stakes in the ground through which then they would put up tents. And when anybody saw them, they would think that they were like big stakes all around the earth. There were stakes, all of them with, you know, small, um, uh, what do you call it, flags flying from there. So because of this, some people started to say that he was a lord of the stakes. That's why Fir'an was called uh, the, the lord of the stakes. Rabbul uh, Autad. So Fir'an Dhul Autad, Fir'an the possessor of stakes. Wa Thamud. And the people of Thamud, and they were people who lived in Jordan, 
or in the north part of, 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 of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and some said they, were, they lived near Tabuk. Wa Thamud, wa Qawmu Lut, and of course Thamud had his, their prophet sent to them, Shu'aib. Wa Qawmu Lut, and the people of Lut, uh, Lut alayhi salatu salam was sent to them. They were uh, people who disbelieved in Allah. Wa Ashabul Aika, and the people of Aika. Who are the people of Aika? Aika was a people from the Thamud, a tribe from the Thamud that lived in the northern part of, the, of Saudi Arabia towards Sham. And this is the same town in which Musa والسلام, had escaped when he had killed somebody in Egypt, then he had escaped from Egypt, then he went to Aika. Aika was a, a town from the people of Thamud and they also disbelieved in Allah and they used to also uh, uh, trade uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, cheating manner. So when they used to trade, they would cheat, they would uh, uh, charge too much and then they would give uh, false uh, weight uh, in return. They were the people of the Aika. They used to worship, why were they called Aika? Because they used to worship a tree called the Aika tree. They used to worship this tree and they thought this tree had blessings Today we, we have these sort of, you know, thinking to, to, uh, as well today. We don't worship them, but we think that they carry some supernatural power like rabbit's foot or four-leaf clover or, uh, you know, omens and charms that we carry uh, like the tawis and the, and the amulets that we carry on our bodies. Throw them away. Throw them away, brothers and sisters. They are misguidance and they are, uh, they are going to take you away from Islam. And these people, they used to worship a tree. Uh, I remember, subhanAllah, even my own village in Bangladesh now, uh, there was a group of people now who apparently worship this bloody tree. So Alhamdulillah, I had it cut down uh, and, and the people went crazy when I cut it down. Uh, but uh, you know what? If you know of people doing these sort of things, worshiping uh, you know, animals or trees, uh, and you know that they are just total misguidance, get rid of them. That's what Umar anhu did. Uh, there was a tree called that and what in the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the people used to worship that tree they used to rub their shields and their bodies on that tree before they fought their war they used to hang their swords from that tree why because they said this tree is that and what is a very blessed tree if we hang our swords from it then we're going to kill all our enemies and so Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw that the Arabs of the desert when they were passing by the tree, they were taking the tree as a blessed place to pray. And so what did Umar do? He had the tree cut down. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, if you find that people are taking these sort of objects as places of worship, then, and if you have a control over that place, of course, don't do it if they are uh, people of different religions, leave them to their own, own way. But if they are in your own family, in your own tribe, and you can see people falling into misguidance, like this calf that the Jews made up, into God. What did Musa do? والسلام, do? He burned the calf and he threw it into the uh, the remains and ashes into the into the river. So this is also what we should do. That if we have the ability and the authority and the power to do so, and we're responsible over the people, and people are worshiping these other things, whether it be tree or a, or a statue, then burn it and remove it. Ula ikal ahzab. They are the ahzab. They were the misguided ones. In kullun illa kathaba rusula fahaqqa yaqab. Verily, all of them did nothing but disbelieve in their rusul, in their messenger, fahaqqa yaqab. So the punishment has become obligatory upon them. Wama yanduruha ula. And they do not see illa sayhatan wahidatan. And they were not, they could not see except, or they woke up in one morning and they did not hear except one thing. What did they hear? Illa sayhatan wahida. One scream. Meaning through the power of a sayha, one scream, Allah destroyed them. Just to show you how Allah's power is so much that even sound, even a scream can destroy the people. وَمَا يَنْظُرُهَا أُولَىٰ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا فَمَا لَهَا مِنْ فَوَاقِ And so they had no escape from that. وَقَالُوا And then they said, what did they say? Some of them said this, and this is also a statement of Abu Jahl that Allah Zawajal is quoting in the Quran. You know, and many of the statements which Allah Zawajal quotes, which are the worst statements, are actually Abu Jahl statements. Just to show you what a jahil this man was. Abu Jahl was Abu Jahl. Yani, you can't define Jahl except by 
describing Abu Jahl. Like if you want to, uh, you know, Martians came from Mars and said, hmm, what is Jahl? What is ignorance? Then you really have to send Abu Jahl because he's the only one that truly exemplifies what Jahl really is, right? Because he's so, so corrupt. Look at, what this, look at this next statement that he said, verse number 16. This is Allah quoting Abu Jahl saying this, وَقَالُوا And they said, Rabbana, our Lord, Ajillana, hurry up. Qittana, Ajillana, Qittana, hurry up our piece of punishment. Qabla yawmil hisab, before the day of punishment. And this is how jahil they were. That they not only disbelieved in Allah, Zawajal, but they also had the audacity to say, Oh Allah, if you're going to punish us, punish us now. And they had the audacity to speak like that. Audhu billah. So question is this, why doesn't Allah respond to him at that point? Why did Allah not punish Abu Jahl at the point when Abu Jahl was asking for punishment? Do you know why? And Alhamdulillah, he didn't punish him at that point. Do you know why? Because if that was a case that Allah would punish at the very point that we deserve the punishment, there would be no one left on the face of this earth. Because we sin all the time. And if Allah was going to punish us at every point that we were sinning, then there would be no one left on the face of this earth. Allah would take us to account. So brothers and sisters in Islam, Alhamdulillah, Allah doesn't take us to account at the moment of our haughtiness and our pride and at the moment of our sinning. But He gives us time. What is the quality of Allah that, 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 that makes Him give us time and respite until our appointed time? It's the quality called hulm from which the name of Allah Al-Halim comes from. The name Al-Halim. You know this name Al-Halim? May Allah Azawajal give you, give you hulm, my brothers and sisters of Islam. Halim is called forbearance. The Halim, Al-Halim, is the God who is the most forbearing. What does that mean? What does forbearance mean? It means that you are a man of, uh, so Al-Halim is someone who is full of ability, full of strength, full of might, full of power, but he also has that amazing ability to withhold his anger and his power from destroying something because of his absolute mercy, forgiveness, love, and affection for that human being. Yeah, That's called Halim. So Halim is not someone who you make him angry and he slaps you. Do yeah, you know people like that? Where you know they are short fused people who you know if you say something, they will lose their cool and they will hit you and fight you. Those people have no hulm at all. But Allah Zawajal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most patient, the most forbearing. And so he overlooks and he gives respite until an appointed time when we are able to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that, gives that appointed time. And that is what gave Fir'aun so many years so that he could continue on his misguidance with Allah being forbearing, waiting for him to, to repent. And that's why Allah was also so forbearing with, Fir'aun, with, with uh, Abu Jahl. Because he was giving him time. 13 years Allah gave him in order to repent to God, in order to come back, in order to stop saying these silly things. This is how forbearing Allah is. Look at how forbearing Allah is with shaitan. The shaitan has been existing for so long. Allah created him. And he's been misguiding, misguiding humanity. Allah is so forbearing that he's given him respite until the day of judgment. So too, Allah will be forbearing with the Jal. The Jal will claim to be God. He will claim to uh, have Jannah and Nar. He will claim to give life to dead and so many other things. Allah will be so forbearing with him until the appointed time when Isa Islam will come and he will destroy him. So my brothers and sisters Islam, when you make repentance to Allah and make tawbah to Allah and ask Allah for more time to not punish you, to free you from Jahannam, use the name Al-Halim. Because it is one of the names of Allah Zawajal that are to do with forbearance and forgiveness. So you say, Ya Tawwab, oh the one who forgives. Ya, ya, ya uh, Rahman, Ya Rahim, the one who is most forgiving, the most merciful. Yeah. Ya Halim, they say, oh, the one who's most for, forbearing, forgive me, oh Allah, I am regretful of my sin, right? And that is when you bring on the mercy of Allah Azawajal. In fact, I just want to tell you this hadith of Rasulullah which is in Abu Dawud that I came across, amazing hadith, just to show you how much Allah's mercy overtakes his anger. 
just to show you how forbearing Allah is. This hadith is reported by Abu Dawud that Jibreel one day came to Rasulullah Sallallahu and said, Ya Jibreel, Ya Rasulullah, if only you could see me. So this is Jibreel. You know, Jibreel is a friend of Rasulullah Sallallahu He would come and speak to him about many things. So one of the things Jibreel did once is he came to Rasulullah Sallallahu and said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, if only you were there on the day when Allah was destroying Fir'aun. Yeah, so Jibreel is telling him when, when Jibreel was there about an incident where Rasulullah was not there. This is when the seas had parted and Musa was being, was, was being saved and Fir'aun was, was chasing him and then the waters were coming down crushing on Fir'aun. At that point, what did, Allah, what, did, what did Jibreel say? He said, Wallahi ya Rasulullah, if you were only there and you would see how at that point as the water was crushing down upon Fir'aun, Fir'aun started, started to say the word of belief. What did he say? Aman tu bi Rabbi Harun al Musa. Right? At that point, he, he, he believed in Allah, right? As the water was crushing down. He said, you should have seen me, O Rasulullah, as I was grabbing with all my wings, 800 wings, 600 wings, as I was grabbing from the earth, from the bottom of the sea, and throwing mud into the face of Fir'aun, trying to stop him from saying the Shahada at that point. Why? Because I was afraid that he would say the shahada before the water would come down crushing on him and Allah's mercy would overtake him. So out of extreme fear of Allah's mercy overtaking this shaitan and his hatred for him, Jibreel was throwing mud in his face, okay, trying to make sure that Fir'aun would not accept Islam. Can you imagine that? Just to show you how Jibreel knows how forgiving Allah is and how absolutely merciful Allah is, how forbearing Allah is. Just to show you, my brothers and sisters of Islam, that this Jahil, Abu Jahl, said this statement, Ajil lana qittana qabla yawmil hisab, give us our punishment for the day of judgment, that Allah and his forbearing nature is so much that he did not take him to account. And if this is the case, this gives tremendous hope for every single sinner, that every sinner out there should really ponder and say, Ya Rabb, you are so Halim, you could have taken me to account, but you haven't. Ya Halim, forgive me, O oh Allah. I've repented to you before my last hour. So forgive me, O oh Ya Rabb al Alameen, and make me from those people who are purified, and write my name from those people who are forgiven from Jahannam today in Ramadan. Ameen, Ya Rabb al Alameen. Taib. We're going to stop here, inshaAllah, at verse number 16. And inshallah, if Allah wills, we will come back to the story of Dawood alayhi salatu salam. Yeah? In page number two of, uh, of Surah Sad, we will come back to the story of Dawood alayhi salatu salam tomorrow, inshallah. Follow through, inshallah, we'll be carrying on every single day in Ramadan with the tafsir of, uh, of the surahs. And ikhwani, my sincere request to all my brothers and sisters in Islam is don't let this Qur'an simply be, you know, a book that is read. Use this book to change yourself. Use the words that I tell you to change your hearts. Uh, spread this message to others. Make sure you tell at least one human being of the tafsir of Surah Sa'd. Tell them to listen to it. Especially as we come to the stories of Dawood and Suleiman. It's so heart-touching, so heart-touching so heart Allah, And so much lessons for us. And do not let a day go past in Ramadan where you read the surah and you read the Quran except that you make a real firm effort in your life to change, inshallah, based upon what you have learned on that day. And with that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people who listen and those who act upon the knowledge that we have. Allah forgive us for what we have done. Allah, O oh Al-Haleem, forgive us for all the sins and the mistakes that we have done. Glory be to Allah who has brought us to Ramadan, given us another chance for repentance. And I ask Allah Zawajah to benefit you all, inshallah ta'ala, with what we hear. Now, these lessons, inshallah, will be put up and available on this website, inshallah ta'ala, for one, one whole day, 24 hours. Tomorrow at 5 p.m. KL time, which is plus 8 GMT, which is, I believe, at about 9 o'clock Greenwich time, uh, 10 o'clock British Standard Time uh, inshallah ta'ala uh, the next lesson will, will come on so I'll be here again and I'll be continuing on with the tafsir of Surah Saad in that, in that 24 hours please encourage everyone to catch up 
those who might be praying tarawih now or asleep now, ask them to please catch up, inshallah, in these 24 hours so that, inshallah ta'ala, they can carry on with the tafsir because once we carry on, then, well, alhamdulillah, many, you know, you will miss out on quite a lot. But I hope that, inshallah ta'ala, if you follow on through this, you'll be able to carry on, inshallah ta'ala. Zakallah khair once again. I uh, hope to see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.